person is excited about that. But um, I've come across the book of Esther because even Annette was talking about it before. I love hearing people's stories. You wouldn't believe, even in this room, some of the stories that are there. If I asked you and, and you shared and, and crazy stuff, some of you have been through some very, very difficult and tough times. But I love hearing people's stories, how they persevered through tough times, how they uh, faced adversity and fought against the odds and came out on top. And if you've been around the Bible for a while, you know the Bible is full of those kind of stories, stories that can encourage us and inspire us as people, whether it be the Joseph of Genesis, uh, mistreated by his brothers. You know, I, I'm going to, we, we actually sang that uh, a part, part of that song that we just sung before the battle belongs to uh, uh, the Lord. And in fact, just can I say this? When we look at the book of Esther, that's what the story's about. In the midst of it all, the battle belongs to the Lord. But uh, they use a bit of that song from the book of Genesis and the story of Joseph of what the enemy meant for evil, God's going to turn it for good. And uh, we, we see that in so many people's stories in the Bible. And so we've got people like Joseph, who was uh, mistreated by his brothers, was thrown into a pit, but he ended up in a palace. An amazing story. Then there was mighty Moses. Or what about the shepherd boy, uh, David, who takes on a defiant giant named Goliath and takes him out and inspires the whole Israelite army to have courage to take on the enemy. And of course, there's, there's Gideon, there's, or Daniel, great stories there. Or even uh, some of you will know the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who were the ones who stood, stood out when everyone else bowed down. They made a difference in the time and place that they lived. There's so many so many stories. There are so many who we could draw inspiration from, but it really is difficult to go past the story of Esther. A brave young Hebrew woman whose heroic acts saved her entire people from certain death. Certain death at the hands of a crooked tyrant. And over the next 19 weeks, I'm going to take you. No, I'm not going to. But I don't know how long it's going to. I don't know how long it's going to be. We'll go with the flow. We'll just, we'll just see. But over the next few weeks, I want to reveal her story from the scriptures in the hope that her story would inspire you in your story in the journey that you are walking and walking out, especially in today's crazy COVID environment. Out of all the heroes in the Bible, Esther is certainly, not because she's just a chick, but her story is certainly one of the most significant. And you might say, well, Pastor, how do you know it's significant? Because well, it's significant because not many people get a festival after them. Not many people get a whole people to celebrate that which was accomplished through somebody's life. People don't get that. You see, the Jewish people to this day celebrate a number of sacred feasts and sacred days. You have the Sabbath day. You have feasts like the, uh, 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 well, you have pa a Passover, of course. You've got Passover, which is another very important Jewish celebration. You have the Feast of tabernacles, you've got all these different sacred days, sacred uh, 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 days that have a powerful meaning to the Jewish people. You have the Feast of Weeks, you have Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. And these days are, are such important days to every Israelite all over the world. They will stop what they were doing. They will stop their job, they will close their shop down, and they will take time to remember, all of these days are about remembering what God has done. Friend, you're going through a hard time, don't forget to stop and remember what God 
has done. Remember where you've come from. Oh, yes, it might be a battle now. But remember from where you have come. Remember where he has brought you from. And so there are so many days that are significant days in Israel's spiritual journey. But every day, every year, sorry, without fail, from the time of Esther to this very day, some 2,500 plus years, Jews around the world take a day to celebrate their tremendous deliverance by the hand of Esther with one of the Jewish people's great feasts, the Feast of Purim. And out of all the Jewish feasts, it is Purim, which is regarded as the fun festival. It's the fun festival. And can I just say, don't we need a bit of fun in the midst of all this craziness that's going around? Don't we need to, to, to it's just, it's all doom and gloom. We need, we need to have a place where, where some fun is happening. But out of all the Jewish feasts, it is Purim, which is regarded as the fun festival festival in the Jewish calendar. In fact, they insist on that festival, you must have fun. <laughs> you will be happy. You ever done that to your kids? This is going to be a great holiday. <laughs> Come on, who's done that? It's just, I mean, it's, I know. But it's a festival where they feast rather than fast. And I tell you why as we will go along. So as we dive in, I pray you'll be blessed. I pray, pray you'll be encouraged along the way. So number one, first point. The book of Esther takes place in Persia. It takes place in Persia, which is modern day Iran. Not Iran, as the Americans say. It's Iran. Modern day Iran. And this was the base, the hub of the great Persian Empire. It says in Esther chapter 1, verse 1, This is what happened during the time of Xerxes. The Xerxes who ruled over 127 provinces, stretching from India to Kush. Now, if you've been part of this church for a long time, you will know that my wife is from India. It is very obvious. So all of us know where India is. But where is Kush? How far away is Kush from India? Well, Kush is actually modern-day Ethiopia. So we've got to understand that this empire, this Persian empire, was very big and very powerful. It stretched all the way from India to Africa. So it was a big empire. It was a powerful empire was this Persian empire. Big and powerful. And I want to pause here and just remind us for a moment that our faith, the faith, the roots of our faith that we, we today are pres prescribed to are not found in the plains of America or in the castles of England, or in the catacombs of Rome. Now the faith, the roots of our faith are found in the Middle East. It's important for us to remember that. They're found in the Middle East from a small land now known or called Israel. You know, when we sing uh, the hymn on a hill far away, stood an old the emblem of suffering, shame. You know the song, but you, well, some of you do. <laughs> but we've got to understand when we sing that song, when we talk about on a hill far away, when we turn our gaze towards that hill, we do not turn our gaze to the west. We turn our gaze to the east. That's the roots of our faith. We turn our gaze to the east, to Jerusalem. It is there that the Messiah came. It is there he died that we might live. 
It is there that we find the empty tomb and are reminded that we do not follow a Christ who was alive and is now dead, but we follow a Christ who is, was dead and is now alive. He has arisen. This is the Jesus whom we serve, whom we follow. And around the sacred city, empires have come and have gone. And throughout history, these empires have attacked, destroyed, and have taken Jewish people captive. Which is how we find a Jewish story taking place in powerful Persia. See, although the Bible, in the Bible we find the book of Esther, if you look at it, and I've brought my big Bible today, because, because just, can I say, off the phone, it's not the same. Because you don't get depth. You don't get the, 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 the context of how stuff happened. It's just scroll, 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 swipe, swipe, scroll, push, copy, paste. But when we look at the Bible, we can get some context of, of history. And so when we look at the book of Esther, the book of Esther is found before Psalms and the book of Job. It's, it's, it's right right back here. But the, the Bible is not, the way it is laid out is not in a chronological order. That just means that's a fancy word for saying the, the way the events took place. It's not, it's not laid out in that way. And so although you find the book of Esther here just before Job, it really should be, if we're looking chronologically, pretty fancy, right? It should be here, after the book of Daniel. That's where it sits in the order of time that it happened. Now, so does Nehemiah, so does Ezra, so does other things. They're not in a chronological order. But I'm just trying to uh, help you understand where it sits in the time and events that took place. See, the Babylonian Empire, of, to which Daniel was in, was conquered by the Persian Empire. They came and took over. The, the Babylonian Empire, of course, is modern day Iraq. Not Iraq. It's Iraq. And so when you stop and go, man, look at these wars they're fighting. Can I just tell you, Iran and Iraq have been fighting for a long time. <laughs> for a very long time. But as you know from the book of Daniel, the Babylonians took captive many Jews and they brought them to their land to teach them their ways and to teach them their culture. Don't live according to your Hebrew ways. Live according to our ways. Can I just tell you, that's what the world wants to do today too. Yeah. And you know that brought heartache for many Jewish people as they were taken from their promised land, from their homeland, and taken to a land they did not necessarily want to be in. You know the psalm, 137, or if you don't know the psalm, you at least know the song by Boney M. You know it, by the rivers of where we sat, there we, when we remembered. Some disco lovers here, I can just tell right now. The song goes on to say, they carried us away to captivity, required from us a song. Now how can we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? That's my Jamaican for you. But which is how we find, and this is how we find Jewish people in foreign lands. This is how we, we find a Jewish story about a young Jewish girl taking place in powerful Persia. Now, the book of Esther, when it begins, it begins with a party, a big party. It begins with a feast and a festival, a royal banquet, which brings me to the second thing I want to say or want you to take note of about the book of Esther is it's number two, a book of banquets. It's a book of banquets. There's a lot of parties, a lot of banquets, and a lot of feasts. In fact, there are 10 chapters in Esther and there are 10 banquets. 
and three of them are in the first few verses. So there's a lot of partying in Persia going on. And I tell you uh, this as it's why, or one of the reasons why, the festival of Purim, and we'll go through that as we walk through this, this book, it is one of the reasons why that Purim is about feasting rather than fasting. It's a celebration. They've been delivered. They've been set free. And part of the theme, if you like, throughout Esther is the whole theme of banquets and meeting and meals together and fest, uh, festivities and, uh, and, and banquets and eating and all these kind of things. And that is why, that is why the, the, the festival of Purim is more about feasting rather than fasting, which is quite opposite to many of the other Jewish kind of holy days. It repeats that theme all the way through. Like I said, in chapter one alone, there are three feasts or three banquets, but none of them is quite like the first banquet in the first chapter of Esther. It says in Esther chapter one, verse two, we're up to verse two, come on. At that time, King Xerxes resigned, uh, sorry, reigned. He didn't resign. He's staying in his job. <laughs> At that time, King Xerxes reigned from his royal throne in the citadel of Susa. And in the third year of his reign, he gave a banquet for all his nobles and officials, the military leaders of Persia and Media. Now, when it's talking about media, it's not talking about the media. Just to be clear, in these days and politics and all that kind of thing, it's not talking about the media being there, although I do believe the BBC was there, the Babylonian Broadcasting Association. I think they were there trying to, trying to catch out what was going, going on. No, media just means the people of the middle lands, the people of the middle lands. So uh, the military leaders of Persia and media, the princes and nobles, of the provinces were present for a full, listen, 180 days. Have you had anyone ask you for dinner for 180 days? For a full 180 days, he displayed, the king did, the vast wealth of his kingdom and the splendor of his glory and majesty. 180 days, that's six, a six-month party. I've lived in India, as you know, and they have some long festivals, some of them 10 days long. That's enough. But 180 days, that's big. The festival, what was it about? What was it about? It was really about showing off the wealth and power and majesty of that king. He was showing off how powerful he was, how strong he was. And he rolled out the red Persian carpet with no expense Spared. It was a Persian party like no others. All the celebrities were, were there. They were wearing their blings, their Rolexes and whatever, and pulling up on the latest model camel, whatever it was. Everybody who was anybody was a part of this party. And then the story goes on to say this, and it's a verse 5. It says, when these days were over, after 100 days, 180 days were over, the king gave another banquet. This is his second banquet, this one just lasting seven days. Just seven days. And it says there were couches of gold and silver on a mosaic pavement. Verse 7 says, wine was served in goblets of gold, each one different from the other. And the royal wine was abundant in keeping with the king's liberality. By the king's command, each guest was allowed to drink with no restrictions. For the king instructed all the wine stewards to serve each man whatever he wished. Sorry, ladies. It's just the men. Whatever they wished. It's an interesting aside that in the festival of Purim, and we'll, we'll, we'll go through this. This is just a little aside all the way through that we'll... Look and understand how this, this festival works. But it's an interesting aside that in the festival of Purim, Jewish men are obligated to get drunk. They're obligated. It is required as a part of the festival that a Jewish man must get drunk. And not just a little bit drunk. Some of you are going, bring it back. No, come on. 
He must get drunk, and he must get drunk to the point where he can no longer determine whether things are right or wrong. How many know that's pretty drunk? It's a part of the obligation. It's part of the festival of Purim because you're required to be happy. And if you're not happy, have another drink. Some of you are going, it's a good festival. We're not doing it here at Connect Church. I'm just telling you, right, that's not going to be the next Connect group, the Purim Connect group. <laughs> not happening, people, not happening. <laughs> And so for the last 2,500 years, once a year, Jewish, even Orthodox Jewish men who would never do it on any other day, they will get drunk. You just YouTube it. There's some funny things there. It's a feasting day, not a fasting day. And you can understand why when you see the theme of the book, how that starts to come out. But how many know that when men get drunk, bad stuff happens? Hopefully not from experience. Not here, but it's the other services we're worried about, isn't it? But we know when men get drunk, bad stuff happens. And that's what happens here. King Xerxes, of course, he's been drinking for seven days. He won't be driving his camel home tonight. He's over the limit. But here's what happens in Esther chapter 1, verse 9. It says, Queen Vashti also gave a banquet. That was his wife, his queen. Queen Vashti also gave a banquet for women. This is the third banquet. We're only up to verse 9, and this is the third banquet in the story. Queen Vashti also gave a banquet for women in the royal palace of King Xerxes. On the seventh day, when King Xerxes was in high spirits, this is now his banquet, when he was in high spirits from wine, he commanded the seven eunuchs who served him to bring before him Queen Vashti wearing her royal crown in order to display her beauty to the people and the nobles, for she was lovely to look at. In fact, the name Vashti means beautiful. That's what it means. Beautiful, good name for a baby. Lots of babies coming. Chris and Rebecca, I don't know. I don't know what they're... No, they're having a boy, so, so that's not going to work. Vashti, no. She was lovely to look at, but when the attendants delivered the king's command, Queen Vashti refused to come. Everybody go, oh. Then the king became furious, as kings do, and burned with anger. And so I want you to understand here, when you read this, is that you've got to understand what's happening in this. Basically, the queen was saying, I'm not willing to pray about for you in front of your drunk mates. In front of your drunk, and all the wives said, amen. amen. I'm just not going to do it. He's been drinking for seven days. I'm not going to do it. And you've got to understand also that when she's asked, and many scholars will agree on this. In fact, the mo most scholars uh, agree on this, that when he's asking for her to appear before the man in her crown, it is with only her crown. Yeah. She's only wearing her crown. You've got to understand from a Middle East kind of guy, that was not the done thing. But because she was beautiful, he's like, hey, guys, take a look at this. Here she is. And she doesn't come. So she's like, she's like she hears the command from the eunuchs, and she's like, Stuff you. In, in whatever, Persian. I don't know what that is in <laughs> Persian. She's like, stuff you, I'm not coming. And we all say, good on you, Queen Vashti. I mean, what was he doing? What was the king doing? He was treating her like property. And in those days, maybe that's how they, they thought. That's how they observed. The woman's place was not one of power, not one of uh, privilege. And he was treating her like property. And can I say, some men treat their wives like property even today. Don't do it. Well, my wife's just going to submit to their husbands. Listen, I, I want to tell you, your wife is not some object to be used for your pleasure. That's not what marriage is about. 
man, we're going to wake up to this. Did it just get awkward in here? Just for a moment. Just for, for a moment. As husbands, we've got to love our wives. Of course, lo- wives have got to love their husbands. But as husbands, we've got to love our wives. And the king didn't get that. They didn't get that in those days. This is why the Bible is so powerful. When you, we read it today and we think, you know, we see Jesus, Jesus interacting with women and we, we, we don't think much of it, but you've got to understand how powerful culture changing that is. Jesus even speaking to woman was revolutionary. But anyway, she's like, King, I'm not coming. Stuff you. And when the king hears that, he has a hissy fit. He's like, this is embarrassing for me, the king's like. So, well, it would have been a lot more embarrassing for her. How many know that, eh? He's like, this is kind of embarrassing. This should not happen. And so, so he talks to his advisors who are there at the party. He talks to his uh, advisors. And can, can I should say this just clear? This is probably a good lesson for today. Don't take advice from drunk people. Can I hear an amen on that? I mean, it's just common sense. Don't take adro- advice from drunk people. And so all the guys are going, no, we can't have this. We can't have this. We're not going to have a woman tell us what to do. They're, they're like, if the woman of the kingdom heard about this, they will all start bossing us around. We can't have that. And because remember, you've got to understand where were all their wives. Their all, wives were, were with, were, they were with Queen Vashti at the party. And so they would have seen the order come in and then suddenly Queen, Queen Vashti says no and they're like, you go girl. <laughs> but unfortunately, it didn't go well <laughs> for Queen Vashti. She ends up, because of her unwillingness to obey the king and that instruction, she ends up losing her crown, losing her position never to come before the king again. And chapter one comes to an end. But it's interesting to me how chapter two starts. It says later on, Esther 2 verse one, it says later on when the fury of the kings, when fury, when the fury of King Xerxes had subsided, he remembered Vashti and what she had done and what he had decreed about her. He had an oops moment. In the message version, it says he had second thoughts about what he had done, kind of like a lot of people after a night on the booze. He had second thoughts about what what he had done. And it says this, and I'm reading from the message paraphrase because it just tells it in a story form. It says in Esther 2 verse 2, it says, The king's young attendant stepped in. They could see the king was upset. The king's young attendant stepped in and got the ball rolling. They said, let's begin a search for beautiful young virgins for the king. Let the king appoint officials in every province of his kingdom to bring every beautiful young virgin to the palace complex of Susa and to the harem run by Haggai. The king's eunuch who oversees the woman. He will put them through their beauty treatments. Then let the girl who best pleases the king be made queen in place of Vashti. And it says, the king liked this advice and took it. Duh, he's a guy. And so here we have the first version of The Bachelor. (laughs) Taken right out there. The Bachelor King. Who will get the robes? Some of you obviously watch The Bachelor. Okay. And here is where Esther enters the story. As Vashti exits, Esther enters. See, Esther is a Persian name. Esther is a Persian name. It's not her real name. Her real name, she she is a Jew. Her Jewish name was Hadassah. 
The name Esther means star. And there's no doubt she's the star of this story. But in Hebrew, one of the root meanings of the Persian name Esther is to hide. She hid her nationality. One of the meanings is to hide, to conceal, to be, to be hidden. And of course, as we will discover, as we move through the book, Esther was someone who hid her nationality. She didn't want it to be, be known. She concealed her Jewish identity. But in this book, it's not only her nationality that's hidden. There are many things concealed, many things that are hidden in this book. God is hidden. God is hidden. God is concealed. One of the most interesting things about the book of Esther is the fact that there is, and this is my third point, no mention of God in the book. None at all. He's hidden. He's concealed. The book of Esther, in fact, differs from pretty much every other book in the Bible, and that it is one of only two books in the Bible that have no mention of God, the other one being the Song of Solomon. In Esther, God is not mentioned at all. The law of God is not mentioned at all. That which comes from the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, it's not mentioned at all. God is not mentioned. The law of God is not mentioned. And that's why among scholars, among many Jewish scholars, they say this book should not be in the Bible for it has no religious value. God is not mentioned in it. It shouldn't be here. And I just say this, God puts whatever books He wants in the Bible. And if He wanted it in the Bible, it's going to be in the Bible. But see, when I read that, I love the fact that God is not mentioned. I love it. I, I think the author has done that on purpose. Here's the thing. If you didn't know that, if maybe today you've just discovered, oh, I didn't know that God is not mentioned in the book of Esther ever anywhere. I want to tell you this. You would never read that book and go, God is not in that book. Oh, he might be hidden, he might be concealed, but you would never read that book and get out the other side and go, oh, I didn't see God. I noticed that. Most people, you won't notice it because you can see God's sovereign hand right throughout that book. Even though he's concealed, even though he's hidden, you can see his sovereign hand at work. See, that's the beauty of this. The beauty of this book is that God is assumed. He's there, you can't, you can't miss him. He's at, he's at work. It's like that song that we sing, even when I don't see it, you're working. You know, we've talked about it another time, but it, it, it's valid here. Even when I don't see it, I can't see you, God. But you're working, even when I can't feel it, you're working. He doesn't stop, he never stops. Working, he's a way maker, a miracle worker, a promise keeper, a light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. And although he's concealed in the story, he's at work. And I want to tell you that sometimes it can feel like in your life he's concealed in the story, but you've got to understand he is at work. I don't know about you, but I wake up every morning and God is assumed in my life. I'm not going, he, he, he was there last night. Where is he? I better find. No, no, he's assumed in the story. God is sovereignty. He is assumed at every point as it is in the events of our lives today. Concealed, hidden. But never do I doubt His work. He is the master cause of every effect. If the story was a painting, He would be the artist. His signature is throughout the story. If you read the story, He's the author. And A.W. Pink said this, God is working out His eternal purpose 
not only in spite of human and satanic opposition, but by means of them. Which means no matter what you're going through, no matter what you're struggling, no matter what is happening in your life, every apparent coincidence, coincidence, God's sovereign hand is at work. And Esther, for all with an eye to see, just as He is at work in the circumstances of your and my life. When we look around at the craziness of the world today, the situations and circumstances that appear wildly out of control, and we go, where is God? I want to tell you, remember, God is at work, sometimes hidden, sometimes concealed, but always working, as Romans 8.28 says, always working for the good of those who love Him. It doesn't say all things are good, but He will work for good for those who love Him, who have been called according to His purpose. God is at work. And that's why I don't believe there are any accidents. If you're here today and you ended up here by mistake and you or somebody brought you along, it's never an accident. We've got to understand God's purpose is at work. That's why we ask and now again we, we would take time in every service to go does anyone need to know Jesus Christ today or is anyone watching today wherever you are do you need to know Jesus Christ today if you are watching and you found us it's no accident that you found us for he's found you and calling you would you give your life to Christ today? Would you bow to Him today? Every head bowed and every eye closed. Let us pray this prayer together. If you need to get right with God today, whether it be in your living room or in this auditorium, let us bow our knee to His sovereign hand. Repeat after me, Lord Jesus. I come to you today, a sinner in need of a Savior. Today, I turn away from my sin and turn towards you. I repent of my sins. I desire to follow you all the days of my life. This I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, for the first time today. Know that the Bible says you're born again. Make sure you keep in fellowship and continue to walk in the Lord. Would you stand, please? And again, as I pronounce this blessing over you who are watching online, but to those who are also in this auditorium, remember, this has a special meaning more than perhaps what we would normally do on a Sunday because we're able to be here and do this together. After the service is over, if you need prayer for anything, there's a prayer station there and some people ready to pray for any need that you may have. But why don't you stretch out your hands like this as I pronounce this blessing, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn His face toward you and give you in all this craziness going on in the world peace. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. It didn't go well for Queen Vashti when she came before the king or refuse to come before the things can go bad. But Esther has to deal with it at a whole new level. What did she have to do? Well, you'll have to come next week to find out. And hopefully all the levels will be off and we'll all be able to be together again. God bless. The service is over.